Okay, we were talking about the difference between using a debit card or a credit card for an internet purchase. And we're not talking about identity theft. We're talking about disputing a charge that you actually made. Okay, cool. Now, I call up my credit card company because I got my statement and I went, ooh, I'm not going to pay this because I, I, you know, I, I never received the item. You call them up and you say, look, I never received this item. I want to not pay that. And they go, fine, pay the rest of the bill, but just don't pay that, that one piece. Okay? Cool. And so, you know, I write a check or however it is I, I pay my credit card bill on a monthly basis and I just not include that one charge and send it off. And they are then going to contact the vendor and say, look, you know, we got a dispute here and they never received anything. So the way it works is the credit card company, you know, sends uh, the, you know, the payment to the vendor, right? Like the guy's selling Beanie Babies. For him, how does the, the guy selling a Beanie Babies get paid? Well, he gets paid through a merchant account. So you use the Visa, goes up to this merchant bank, and the merchant bank sends money to this vendor, okay? But when there's a dispute, they won't send the money to the vendor. They'll say, look, we're not, we're not gonna get, we're not gonna pay you for this disputed charge. Now think about this for just a minute. Is it in the best interest of the credit card company to pay the vendor or not pay the vendor from their perspective. I mean, forget about you and forget about the, the vendor, okay? Just from the credit card company's point of view, is it better for them to hold the money and make interest on it or is it better for them to pay the vendor? Well, clearly it's in their interest to not have to pay. So they're on your side, right? because it's better off for them. In fact, they probably would say, please do you know, issue another fraud alert or another dispute charges because, right? They're, they're quite frankly, they're kind of sort of making money off of it because they could keep, your, keep that money without having to pay it off to a vendor, cool? Now let's compare that to a debit card. So the debit card, the process has already gone through. The vendor has already been paid. So you call up your, your bank or whoever issued you your debit card and say, hey man, I want to dispute those charges. It's like, well, it's too late. You know, the guy, it's already been paid. Well, I'm going to get my money back. Well, now, now you're just being a pain in the butt, right? You're just annoying them. They have no vested interest to help you at all, right? I mean, one, the, the credit card company, they're actually kind of sort of on your side, but they have a vested interest to figure this out. The debit card people, it's like, man, you're just causing me work. See the difference? Ooh, okay. Think maybe something like that might be on a quiz? Hmm, okay. So there's things in here called reloadable prepaid cards, like gift cards, right? There's a thing called a general purpose reloadable card, a GP, they even have acronyms. A GPR card. You just go to the store and get a Visa card and you just load it up, use it whenever you want. That makes really good. There's the, um, where, you know, if there's a dispute or something, it's like, pfft, screw it. You know, just throw that one away, so to speak. Close out, take the money out of it, and, you know, throw the card away. You don't even, you don't even have to report it to anyone. It's like, well, I'm not doing that. Take my money out of the card, throw the, throw the card in the trash, and move on. This is a thing called an open loop gift card, which is practically the same thing. Uh, some of these have a purchase price plus a monthly fee. Ugh. That means, in other words, while you're holding this open loop gift card, it's actually costing you something during that period of time that you're not using it. That's not good. But otherwise, it's one of those fill it, fill it up, use it, you know, lather, rinse, repeat. You just do it over and over again. So if you wanted to, if you do an awful lot of business over the internet where you're buying stuff, it, it might be sense to actually have, you know, an extra prepaid card. That means I'm getting ready to buy something that costs $200. So I take a prepaid card, I put $200 on it, I use that card to uh, to buy my item. Charges go through, everything's fine. If somebody broke in to that company and stole my credit card information, it would have zero balance on it because I only put the amount in that I knew I was going to spend. Okay, you guys following. I'm telling you some good advice here, more than just teaching you about yeah, you know, information security and risk management. I'm trying to tell you some other good stuff, so pay attention. Okay, moving along. On page 139, I talk about export and espionage laws. Um, 
Man, there's been some crazy stuff. It wasn't that many years ago that uh, there was a ban on certain game consoles that you couldn't sell them in Iraq or Iran because they were afraid that they were going to use the processors in the game consoles to, you know, build computers to, you know, process uranium or something goofy thing. I mean, there were, it was, some of it was laughable, okay? Okay, there was a period of time, for example, that the, uh, the algorithm for doing the uh, defense encryption, so, uh, the DES encryption standard, um, there was a period of time that the algorithm itself was considered a military secret, okay? And just to prove the point on how stupid that was, a guy went and made a t-shirt, okay? That had the algorithm on the t-shirt, okay? Printed on the t-shirt. You know, he walks through the airport and grabs his flight and goes off to Paris. And no one says anything, right? But it has, you know, basically a military secret printed on the t-shirt. Okay, so some of these are kind of crazy. And first of all, I mean, unless you travel an awful lot, you probably do not know what export laws are current. So anytime you're getting ready to go put, oh, abroad, you really, really need to go out and check this out. So Microsoft has a, a, a website that they, you can go to that basically says, you know, here's all the things that, you know, that we we're concerned with, and the if if you are a university employee, then you know if you're ha if you're doing a, a research project for the university and you have, you know, critical data about that research project on your laptop, ooh, there may be some export rules. Okay. The next one is one of those laws that was built. It's a, an anti-law. That's not probably a poor way to describe it, but hang on. It's called the Security and Freedom Through Encryption Act. Instead of the law saying, here's the things you can't do, this is one of those laws that, here's, that says, here's the things that you can do. So you have my permission to do this thing. So an anti-law? I, I think I just made that up. Basically what it's saying is that this particular act um, reinforces the person's right to use or sell encryption without regard to any type of regulations and thing. It prohibits the federal government from requiring the use of encryption for contracts and grants and other type of official documents. And the state that use encryption is not probable cause. In other words, the fact that they found an encrypted file on your phone, the fact that it was encrypted, it, that alone is not probable cause for uh, you know, a search warrant. There's no probable cause just because you encrypted something. And then it provides some penalties that if you did use encryption in a combination of a, a criminal act, well, then you could get in a little bit, a little bit deeper. Okay, kind of cool. Okay. Uh, the next one on page 139 is copyright. Uh, this is intellectual property. Now, when the copyright was originally intended or written, it was way back when, and it's basically written things. You know, it was, you know, stories and poems and things of that nature. Then it's gone, you know, it's now any type of published work, quote unquote. Um, choreography is one of the things that's covered. You know, a song, a video. I mean, it covers an awful lot of stuff. So it has been extended to to electronic format. You know, like sound files and video files and you know graphic files on on the computer. Now, um, let's say I have a computer. I mean, a, a, a website, and. Uh, I don't have, I, I put a, uh, an image out there. In fact, let me, let me just go to one. So I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna type in my website. Okay, so here's a little graphic, a little spinning thing. Now, nowhere in here does it say that um, this is copyright, right? Nowhere. So does that mean somebody could go in there and steal my little spinning symbol and use it? No, I do not have to explicitly claim copyright in order for it to be covered under copyright. Copyright is any published work. I don't have to say that it's copyright. Okay, good. The Motion Picture Association of America are the ones who kind of went ape in the early days of the, of the internet because people were, you know, releasing, you know, movies. Uh, online and that they went crazy. So they came up with all sorts of rules. Um, so 
let's talk about this legal issue or ethical issues associated with graphics. So let me give you an example. Um, back when I was in grad school, I put together a paper and I wanted to use a, a Dilbert cartoon on the cover of my, uh, my paper because it, it very much encapsulates exactly the topic of my paper. So I sent a note to Scott Adams and saying, look, I'd like to use this three panel um, cartoon of yours on the cover of my paper. It's not gonna, I'm not selling the paper or anything like that. It's just used for, and, they, and he came back and said, thank you very much. Great, that's considered fair use and you're good to go. Boom, okay? I specifically asked permission to use that Dilbert cartoon in my paper, okay? Good. Let's continue. Financial reporting on page 140. The Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002. Okay, so part of the problem is, um, you know, lying, cheating, and stealing is kind of a nebulous thing, right? But if you deliberately deceive people, like on a financial re report or prospectus, then this is when this law comes out. In other words, you can't deceive people in financial documents, okay? You can't lie on a corporate report. And one of the things that's kind of interesting behind this is that it makes the, the CEO of the company personally liable. Ooh, we're not talking about a fine to the company that the company pays. We're talking to a fine to an individual that the individual pays, okay? It makes a lot of difference, right? Cool. They have to personally certify that the information in the prospectus or the information in this financial report is accurate. Yeah. And if they mess up, they they're, could go to jail or most likely get a fine. The next one on the list on page 141 is the Freedom of Information Act, FOIA. Um, I used to work in a federal organization, so we got plenty of FOIA requests. This is for requests for information for things that you would think that are public records. And so I'm in the midst of doing a report or something and somebody says, I'd like a copy of that report. Well, if it, if it falls under the categories, which practically everything does, there's only a few exceptions, you know, like criminal investigations and drafts and things, you know, things that are considered, you know, top secret or something. But if I'm just a worker bee working on some draft, um, then yeah, they could ask for a copy of the report as it, you know, when it was finished. And I, under the FOIA rules, I'd be obligated. And there's a time limit. I mean, you gotta you gotta respond within so many days. I mean, it, it's pretty substantial stuff. Now it doesn't apply to every, all, just federal government, right? FOIA is for just for the federal government. Okay, good. The next thing on page 141 is the the Payment Card Industries Data Security Standards. So it's called PCI DSS. PCI DSS. And what this basically says is a bunch of people got together. These are people, you know, the credit card companies got together with the vendors, the online vendors, pre predominantly online, but doesn't have to be. Uh, that basically says there are six areas where we need to be, make sure that you have security for credit card data, you know. One is I need to build and maintain a secure network. I need to protect cardholder data. I need to maintain vul vulnerability management. I need to implement strong access control. I need to regularly monitor and test. Um, I, so uh, I need to maintain a, a security policy, okay? So those are the things. Now, these are all very good and, and if you if you open a business and you want to be a member of the payment card industry and you want to sign up for that, that's great. You could put a little doodad little thing in your corner of your of your website saying, you know, I'm a member of the PCI and I'm following the DSS. And that would be a good incentive that basically says there's a li less likelihood that you, your credit card information that you're using is going to get compromised, right? So it's a pretty good deal. The problem here is this thing is voluntary. I mean, you have to want to do this. There's no law in the U.S. that says I am must, like, protect credit card data. Now, let's contrast that with the EU, where the EU has something extraordinarily similar to this, except they made it mandatory. If you're going to take someone's credit card data, you are going to be obligated to keep it safe. We don't have that in the U.S. This is completely voluntary, and I think that's a little weird. Anyway, 
We're coming up on the 15 minute mark. 